I feel like you have a, even as a student and a, somebody early in your career, a window of time where you can say, I just want to learn. I just want to be a sponge. I want to raise my hand and sort of play that card that like, I'm just here to, you know, whether it's getting coffee with you or sitting in on a meeting that I'm just trying to observe and, and soak it all in. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast, a podcast about women who work in sports. I'm your host, Jahan Blake. After 15 years of working for three major league teams, including the Boston Red Sox, Los Angeles Dodgers, and the Chicago Cubs, I discovered the one thing I loved the most was helping women in sports shatter glass ceilings and take their seat at the table. I loved it so much that I made a business out of it. I have the honor of coaching high-performing women in the sports and entertainment industry and supporting them as they go after exactly what they want in their career. So if you are feeling tired of waiting on the sidelines, done being overlooked for promotions, and you're ready to pull ahead of the pack and take your career to the next level, girl, I'm here for it. I also created the Game of Her Own podcast to support you as well. We are here to share the stories of incredible women who work in sports and entertainment. These leaders and trailblazers will inspire you with their success and the lessons they've learned along the way to the top. Ladies, There is nothing like women empowering women. I am so honored you're here. Y'all know that I love networking, right? I talk about it all of the time because it 100% benefits your career growth. Now I've always naturally gravitated towards networking really because I love getting to know people. I love helping when I can and I love connecting people. I met our next guest through networking. Someone introduced us and I cannot be more grateful. Kelly Higgins, Vice President of Partnership Marketing for US Soccer is an incredible woman who works in sports. Her insights are going to leave you feeling empowered when it comes to your own career. Some of the common threads in her journey are allyship, networking, and authentically showing up as herself. You are going to love hearing her story. We talk about a lot of different things, how she made the jump to becoming an executive, how she turned around feelings of self-doubt and imposter syndrome, why she was transparent about what she didn't know while she was working at NBC Sports. She talks about why it's okay to raise your hand to get different exposure within your organization. She also gives some advice on deciding if getting your master's degree is the right move for you. All right, Game of Her Own listeners, let's do this. Kelly, welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast. I am so glad you're here. Thank you for having me. Take us back in time and tell us when you first fell in love with sports. When I first fell in love with sports, all right, I'm going to take it all the way back. So I grew up in Port St. Lucie, Florida. I have an older brother. He's about three years older than me. And growing up with him, I was always the the tomboy tagging along with everything that he did. Um, It was always John and Kelly. So between him and my dad being huge sports fans, sports was just a a big part of my life from from playing, watching my brother play, watching the Dolphins with my dad. It was just, it was a Higgins family tradition to just be immersed in the sports world. And so my older brother actually ended up working for the Mets minor league facility and spring training facility in my hometown of Port St. Lucie. Um, when he was in high school, he was a bat boy and kind of worked his way up through the ranks into the front office. And so when he went off to school, I ended up sort of working my way in to take his position at the, at the ballpark. So I was 15 years old, started working in the press box, doing the sound effects and music during the games. So you see little old 15 year old me as the only girl in the press box with a couple of older guys that have have been in the industry a while. And I sat there for, you know, six hours each, each game, hearing their stories and understanding the game of baseball from their perspective and just falling in love with being a part of that. And then, you know, each year I, I worked (laughs) each summer in the press box through high school, but then again, kind of worked my way onto the promotions team. So a little bit of dancing on the dugout, handing out, you know, partner premiums, bringing kids on the field to participate. It was minor league baseball, right? So it was more of a a show. So I was a part of that show. And uh, this is a fun story, actually. So not only was I doing the minor league baseball games, but I was doing spring training specifically in my senior year of high school. And I convinced my, uh, one of my teachers was one of our, like, I guess, like utility classes or something along those lines and, and convinced him to let me leave class early so I could go work the spring training baseball games because uh, he was also a big fan. So grew up 
I guess it's a long story, but just kind of grew up in it in high school, went back every summer in college to, to work at the ballpark. They were my, my second family. Um, and in college, did a bunch of internships um, with minor league arena football teams, with IMG academies. So I, I knew pretty early on that, especially getting exposed to it in high school, that I, I wanted to work in sports and was going to do just about anything I could to, to make it a long-term career. Wow. So you got your break, so to speak. At 15, like you started working in sports. Like so many people are like, oh, I don't even know. Like, I didn't even know you could work in sports. Like when, you know, you're in high school. Wow. Mm -hmm. Did you think you'd always, or you wanted to be in baseball? I mean, there's a lot of history there for you. I didn't know that I always wanted to work in baseball. I loved baseball. Again, growing up, that was probably between the Marlins and the Dolphins and then the Mets, obviously being in my hometown, like that was, you know, what I I knew and and loved, but I didn't know specifically that that's really where I wanted to be from a long-term perspective and working in sports. I just knew that I loved the game. I loved being around that atmosphere and kind of having a different day to day and being out and about from behind a desk. And so I I just kind of had at least the general idea of that was, that was the route that I wanted to go from a long-term career perspective, but wasn't really specifically sure. So what did you do when you graduated college? Yeah. Like, what did you, like, how'd you get your first full-time job? So that's sports? actually a really good transition. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So in undergrad, I somehow had heard about the UCF DeVos program. Um, and so then I got the idea that if I didn't know hundred percent what I wanted to do long-term in my career, the next most logical step for me was to, to go to grad school. And to give myself a little bit. Wait, stop. I yeah. am the, you're the only person who has said that. And I have the exact same story. Like I literally really? was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I'm going to yeah. go to grad school. Like why? <laughs> why yeah. just, let's just keep going to school, right? Like racking up bills. It's fine. <laughs> I'm kind of a nerd. So I love school and I admit it, but I was like, okay, well, you know, this will set me apart. Right. I, my, my brother didn't get it under, uh, didn't get a master's degree. I had seen him kind of make his pathway. So he ended up working in sports too, uh, long-term. So he was at ESPN and, you know, kind of seeing him and understanding his journey and he being a mentor to me along the way, just kind of gave me some perspective that, you know, if I could separate myself even just a little bit and and understanding the industry um, from him, then, you know, why not explore grad school? And so UCF really piqued my interest because it was a a bit of a combination of um, obviously not only the sports marketing and your double master's degree, but it was really, how do you use that degree? How, How do you use sports to make a difference in society? And I think that was something that was a real passion point for me and what I recognized in my journey through high school and college. And what I think sort of motivated me is that I, I love sports, but I also love giving back and making a difference and just the, you know, the, the personal gratification of seeing somebody experience a once in a lifetime memory or, you know, just seeing that what sport can do to make a difference in, in, in that lens. So UCF having that as a foundational element of the program of really bringing in the lens of, you know, how are we, how are we making a difference with the power of sport. Went to UCF is an amazing program, had a, an incredible cohort. And I think you've actually talked to a, a few of my classmates I saw earlier. Cara Adams was, was one of your recent um, yeah. podcast attendees. I'm actually speaking in her class later today at Lynchfield uh, College, which is nice. fun. So we certainly stay in touch, but that was a great program. I think for me, one of the other drivers of it was Dr. Sutton. He was a director in, in the program. And when I was researching the program, I, I saw his accolades and, and what he had done in the industry and knew that, you know, not only would I have a good chance to, to learn from him, but also understand his perspective and, and meet some of his network. So I was lucky enough to be his grad assistant in the program. And yeah, he took me under his wing and, and challenged me in, in ways that like, I um, certainly needed and, and was very grateful for looking back on it. He's been my mentor since then and a father figure, probably more importantly, he's just been an, an incredible ally for me in, in my journey. So he was really responsible for my first job. <laughs> Circling back to your original question. Um, <laughs> it's fine. I totally uh, forgot it too. I was like, wait, I have all these other questions. Wait, before we get to that, getting your first job. So you mm-hmm. went to get your master's now, like you were candid about why. Um, yeah. And I always am as well, but a lot of people cut like, will call me and they're like, should I go get my master's? Yeah. I'm not getting a job in sports. I'm not getting the job I want. Will it help me stand out? What do you, what do you think? 
You know, it's it's been interesting as I'm in the hiring process right now for a number of roles. And I think it certainly, in, in my perspective, demonstrates more so like your character and your drive that you you want to further your education and, and build your, your knowledge base. At the end of the day, is it a must have? No, but I think there's a lot of value in it, not only from obviously from an educational perspective, but I think from a building your network standpoint and understanding you know, perspectives of your colleagues having exposure to different organizations, whether that's through, you know, a lot of programs do speaker series, but also, you know, more tangible projects and working with organizations. So I think there's a lot of value in just the networking and, and furthering your your community, but also in, in just getting exposure to, to other things. But I think there's a lot of ways you could still start your journey in sports without it. But I'm also seeing a lot more folks in the you know first few years of their career going and doing it part time and again i think it's really just you know challenging themselves and how are they continuing to expand their their knowledge base and you know for me it was again not just the chance to figure out what the hell i wanted to do with my life but i also looked at it as it was a dual degree so it was a masters in sport business and an mba and so i said if if for some reason i decided that sports wasn't for me long term it gave me a little bit of a, a way to pivot and, and potentially use just some of the baseline business knowledge from the MBA to potentially go uh, a different route in my journey mm-hmm. outside yeah. of sports. Okay, good. That's good. Uh, that's good advice. Now, okay, back to Dr. Sutton. So he was responsible for your first job, did you say? He was. I mean, and many other jobs. He's actually responsible for the job that I'm in right now. And I could get to that story at some point in this conversation. <laughs> but he introduced me to the MBA and the team marketing and business operations team bow group. And so he was, I guess you could say one of the founders, if not the founder back in the day of, of team bow when he was on a sabbatical and working for David Stern. So he special place in his heart and with team bow. And so when I was Reaching the uh, graduation, I had interviewed with a number of organizations, the Magic and, and others, and Teambo was really where I would sort of set my, my sights on, not thinking that I really wanted to live in New York long term, but knew it was going to be a great opportunity to, to learn from some of the best. So um, my first job was really an entry-level job as an administrative assistant and event planner for Teambo, uh, working with all of our account managers and doing expenses and booking travel and then also helping to, to plan events. And so this is a good word of advice for many uh, people coming out of grad school with two master's degrees is just be humble, right? Like I wanted to get my foot in the door. I recognized that I had had at that point, you know, seven plus years of experience of internships, but knew like coming into the MBA and, and into a group like Teambo, it was an incredible opportunity just to, just to get in, you know, started relatively in a junior level role, made the commitment to do that for two years, but you know, made the most of that role and and trying to take on projects outside of the scope of my my day to day to learn about the business, to understand where within the business I really wanted to to focus, right? The beauty of Teambo is that they represent sort of the the team structure and and focusing on ticketing and marketing and sponsorship and digital, et cetera. So I knew it would be a chance for me to kind of see the 50,000 foot view of the industry and start to figure out where do my skill sets and interests sort of align within a particular vertical of the business. For everybody who doesn't know, will you explain Teambo? Yeah. So Teambo is essentially the internal consulting group for the MBA league office. So while we're based, we, I still say we, it's really a, a habit at this point, based <laughs> in the league office, the, the role of Teambo is really to support all the teams across all four leagues, MBA, W, G League, and 2K League. And the primary focus is to understand, you know, how can teams generate more revenue at the end of the day, right? But more importantly, how how do we continue to innovate, uh, be first movers in the sports industry, collecting best practices, whether it's within the industry or outside of the industry, and just serving as that that resource for thought partnership, for data and analytics, and again, to you know identify new opportunities for, for teams to continue to, to grow grow their business, grow the revenue, and just ultimately lift lift the whole from from teams to, to the league. So mm-hmm. internal consulting group liaison with with all the teams. Tell us more about this. So you said you took jobs outside of your scope. Like so you had your first full-time job, but then you were trying to grow. And so you were taking on really it sounds like 
other opportunities because you were in an entry-level job. What did mm-hmm. that look like? I think now a lot of people are like, yeah, I'll take on more, but you need to pay me more, right? So like mm-hmm. which one comes first? And I feel like I don't, I've been in, you know, sports for 20 years. And so then it looked a lot different than it does now. So like, oh, I what tell us like what you did and looking back, would you do it the same way? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an interesting point. So I came in and it was a pretty base baseline salary, was not making very much whatsoever. But again, I knew it was going to be an opportunity for me to, to learn and grow and be a sponge. And so within my role, again, I was primarily supposed to be focused on our account managers and supporting them and, and basic administrative stuff and event planning. But there was opportunities like working with our analytics team to help facilitate a WNBA team season ticket holder survey. So helping to actually like execute the survey, taking the survey results, digesting it and working alongside our analytics team. I knew that ticketing wasn't really where I wanted mm-hmm. to be, but I knew that it was going to help me actually understand how our fans thought. I go work more closely with our analytics team, knowing that also Excel data digestion, not a strong skill set of mine at the time, but it was going to get me a chance to just learn and, and challenge myself. I also raised my hand to be the liaison between our group and the MBA's social responsibility team and, and sitting in on their meetings and identifying opportunities to um, do more with our teams to do more with our, you know, with the team boat group. And so it was really finding those windows of time outside of what my day-to-day responsibilities were to take on more while still doing my day-to-day responsibilities and, and, and demonstrating that I'm still doing my job, but like I'm going above and beyond to take on more and, and challenge myself. And I was certainly wasn't getting paid more, but again, it was really just the chance to to soak in knowledge from other people within my group, outside of my group, and and continue to start to figure out from a navigation perspective where I wanted to be. And I I wouldn't change a thing in terms of what I had done. I probably would have taken on more. I feel like you have a, even as a student and somebody early in your career, a window of time where you can say, I just want to learn. I just want to be a sponge. I want to raise my hand and sort of play that card that like, I'm just here to, whether it's getting coffee with you or sitting in on a meeting that, I'm just trying to observe and, and soak it all in. And that's probably a piece of advice that I give a lot of students today is just use that card to say, hey, I'd, I would love to get coffee with you and, and learn from you, understand what you do or shadow you or sit in on a meeting. And I think it really opens up your, your perspectives to what people's jobs are in a day to day and really how the how the business works. Yeah, it's it's tough, right? Because I agree with you. And then there's people like, well, if you look at it, right, you can either take the experience and do it for free or not do it at all. You can look at it as additional education that you're getting for free, even though they're getting something out of it. And I guess maybe it wasn't even long-term. You tell me, right? Like you were getting all this exposure, but it's not like you were like for five years, I sat in on meetings and learned from the best. Like I'm imagining it was short-term. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I'd say it was, it was project-based, but then you know, there were cer- certain opportunities, again, like being the liaison with our social responsibility group that lasted a little bit longer through my tenure at the NBA, where I then had built relationships and I was really passionate about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I continue to, you know, be that, that resource. And it, it got a little harder as my responsibilities grew. And I ultimately coming out of the admin role, and I committed to two years of that before I could shift into a more dedicated vertical. And so that's when I, you know, after two years, I shifted into the partnerships vertical and focused solely on partnerships work for Wendy Morris. And so, you know, I still sort of kept that piece of my role to be the social responsibility liaison, because again, I knew that it was going to make me better. It was a passion point of mine and something that I could apply into more of my, my day to day too. I think it's a balance of, I'm probably not the best person to talk about work-life balance by any means. Um, (laughs) But at that early on in my career, like I was throwing myself into it and I knew that like I, you know, it was a little bit of a sacrifice in in some of the the fun parts of my living in New York City, but I wanted to learn. I wanted to grow. And, you know, I said that Teambo and at that time specifically just straight out of grad school, it was almost an extension of grad school for me and how I sort of approached Mm -hmm. my day to day was just to try to gain as much knowledge as I could to then, you know, my next step, uh, apply it a little bit further. How did you nurture 
your relationship with Dr. Sutton. So now you're gone, you're, you've graduated. And I think, and I asked this question because a lot of people struggle with that. Well, okay, like, do I, should I call them every couple of months or like, how, should I write them emails? Should we have touch bases? And I'm like, I think it could be a little bit more natural than that. You know, like, I don't know that it has to be so prescribed. So I, I'm curious as to how you kept, I mean, you're still in touch. So how you keep that relationship going. We were just texting this weekend. He sent me a really nice text on Sunday. <laughs> it was part intentional, right? Where I would say, you know, look, I should you know, check in with him every couple of months or share some of the cool things that I'm doing, you know, send a thank you again for you know this opportunity and, and helping me get here and recognizing what if he did to do that. Um, and then there was just the organic opportunities whenever he was in New York, like making a point to grab coffee with him to join our, we do an alumni dinner, um, at a pizza place every year. And so making sure I was there and spending time with him and he and his wife, Sharon, they're just an amazing people. And so bonded with both of them. So now again, it's every year they come up to New York. We, we go out to dinner, we do some sort of activity. It's just a, a normal thing for us, but I think it's a balance of, you know, finding those moments to organically share what's happening or something that might be interesting to to him, celebrating birthdays and his anniversary, that that type of stuff. Social media certainly helps with some of that, but it's just, (laughs) it's a little bit of both, like making sure that I don't go, especially it's a little bit harder now as things are a little crazier, but making sure we don't go more than a few months with at least some touch point of the text of, hey, check out this chocolate dessert that I just ate or thinking about you and happy birthday. Yeah. It's just easy stuff. Yeah. Once you connect with somebody and you're not going to be that way with everybody in your network, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, you're not going to be that way with everybody in your network. And then some people just become more than just someone who's in your network. They become, you know, friends and parts of your lives. And yes, he has that title of mentor, but you can become more, like you said, fate, like family and that's okay too. So it's just figuring out who those people are. And for lack of a better word, I've had a hectic morning, like latch, latch on. I want to say something better than latch on, but I can't think of it right now. But do you know what I mean? Like just connect with those people and don't let go. Like those, if you feel like there's a connection there. Tight. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hold them tight. I'm so much better than latch yeah. on. <laughs> latch on sounds a little clingy. <laughs> I don't want to be a stage five clinger, but I'm going to hug you. There's certain people that you just want to want to embrace. And, and Doc, Doc has done that for me and I've certainly reciprocated. And I guess I should say too, like he's been a great sounding board, right? As I've moved through my career journey as I've explored new opportunities he keeps it real with me and I think that's one of the things I love about him the most like he's not afraid to put me in my place or to tell me like it is and and I feel like I have really tried to use use those moments and those opportunities with him where I am probably in a place where I'm you know, conflicted on, you know, taking a a role or a project or something like that. And and knowing I could go to him to be that authentic sort of sounding board is, is, is really a special thing to have too. I love that. Hey, Jahan here. I hope you're enjoying the interview. I'm sure you are thinking about your own career right now and how you can pull out in front of the pack to take your career to the next level. For 18 years, supporting women in sports has been my favorite part of my career. And I would love to support you, whether it's joining my free Game of Her Own community or one of my one-on-one coaching programs. I am here for you. Send me a message at jblake at jahanblake.com or DM me on Instagram at jahanblake. And let's schedule a time to have a free session. I cannot wait to hear from you. All right, let's get back to why you're here. Okay. So tell us more. All right. So we got stuck at Teambo because I had so many questions, but (laughs) after you... How long were you at Teambo and then where did you go next? So I was in Teambo for four and a half years. So again, the first part of it was on the admin role. The second part was focusing specifically in partnerships and being that day-to-day for the teams within just the partnership lens. So after four and a half years, I I started to recognize that, again, I had a really great 50,000 foot view of the industry, but I needed to go do it. I wanted to have more of the hands-on experience. I wanted to work with brands, I wanted to see some of these ideas and things that I was pitching to teams or presenting to teams that worked really well. I wanted to do it. So I had the opportunity, ironically, to go back to the Mets 
but here in the major league capacity in New York as a sponsorship activation manager. So my role was to uh, bring to life, I think at that time I had 20-ish partners, bring to life those partnerships, everything from the day-to-day management to the activation to actually being a part of the renewal. So it was one, super special to go back to the team where I started my career in Uh my 15-year-old days, Um, but now to do it at the major league level and to, to have a better sort of foundation that I was able to take from Teambo and and to apply it. Baseball was, man, that was a, a journey. It was a lot of fun. When I had started, it was August of 2015, uh, right before we made the World Series run. So it was just an incredible introduction into major league sports and our partners. And to, to see that journey was disappointing when we lost, but I feel super lucky that I was able to experience that early on yeah. in my career. No matter what, like when you, you get your master's, right? You have this experience since you were 15, like, but I don't know about you, but like, no matter what imposter syndrome, like self-doubt, all those things like sort of creep in. Yes. Even if you have like great support, like a doctor set and plus other people we don't know about, you know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't like, it's part of life for some of us. And it's sometimes so unfair, (laughs) you know what I mean? (laughs) Like, it's just like, why are you here? Go away. But did you ever suffer from that or deal with that? Oh yeah. i still to this day coming from team Bo, right. Where it's touted as one of the most unique assets in the, the sports industry. Right. And, and having had the opportunity to work for them was really an, an incredible experience and, and certainly resume builder. So there was a bit of a pressure that I perhaps was putting on myself, but also recognize that I'm, I'm coming from this place that is recognized to have some really talented people. So I need to, I need to represent Right. And then I've, I've, I should be coming here with all of these great ideas and, you know, again, representing what, what Timbo is in the NBA. And so I certainly felt pressure to do that and, and to show that I was qualified and that I, that I deserved to be in this role that I had deserved to be in, in Timbo. And, you know, it took a bit of an adjustment, but I also sort of used it to say like, okay, this is a good challenge for myself to say, okay, like, how do you apply all the things that you've learned? How do you demonstrate that? Like you deserve to be here and um, you soaked in all that knowledge from Timbo. And now you could actually help make an impact here with our partners, with the Mets and, and bring some of those learnings with you. And I tried to turn it into more of a, a fun challenge for me to say like, look, now I can actually do it. I can host a brainstorm and show, you know, some of these best practices that I collected kind of build my confidence a bit that, yeah, I, there was a lot of things that I had taken away from the MBA and I can do this, but it, it took some time to overcome that. And again, throughout my journey, whether it was going to NBC sports afterwards and being out of, you know, the traditional partnership realm and in a world of media with a lot of white men and being one of few females. And again, in a role within sports, that was a little bit uncomfortable for me. That was certainly the imposter syndrome and being at a higher title. That was a tougher one to navigate. I can dig into that a little bit if you want, but. Oh yeah. You know, I'm <laughs> like, I literally, as soon as you said, it, I was like, oh, we need to talk about that more. I wrote it down. Yeah. Tell us, tell us more. And what was so your title my- then? when you were at NBC yeah. sports. So at the, at the Mets, I was there for another couple of years. I had shifted to the sales side a little bit to challenge myself on, on that side. I didn't think I wanted to do sales, but I think I wanted to do continue to try to get out of my comfort zone. Well, I did that tenfold um, going to NBC Sports. So this opportunity came about from uh, one of the alumni in Dr. Sutton's program, the UCF program, who had worked for Jenny Storms back in the day. And Jenny had you know, short shared within her network, this role that she was hiring for. And the role was to almost kind of replicate the Teambo concept within NBC Sports headquarters. So it was going to be a director of marketing, but supporting all of the regional sports networks. So across the country, there are seven regional sports networks. They would essentially be not necessarily reporting directly in, but working with me to develop what is our overarching marketing strategy? How are we revamping sort of the approach to marketing as it relates to regional sports networks? So getting out from behind the news desk and really embracing fans, authentic fans and leveraging the team assets. So when Danielle Smith, love her, she approached me with this role. She's like, look, Kelly, I think it's interesting because it's somewhat similar to what you're doing at the NBA, but you know, it's with Jenny Storms, who at that time had just been named one of the most powerful women in sports. So she's like, just have the conversation. 
So in my mind, I had said, I don't know anything about media, but Jenny seems like kind of a badass. So let me at least have the conversation and understand the role. And, and two weeks later, I was hired. But I'll never forget I, the interview that I had with Jenny when I when I met with her in Stanford and we we're having lunch. And I said to her, like, look, I, I don't know anything about media. And my brother was at ESPN. Like, I never really understood what he did on a day to day basis. I had had some exposure to it at the Mets, but like, it's not, it's not my wheelhouse. She's like, that's okay. That's actually what I think is valuable about you and what you can bring to the table. You understand fan engagement. You understand brands and you know, sort of thinking outside of the box as it relates to creative ideas to market and, and leveraging team assets. And that's really kind of what we're, we're looking for here. I can teach you media. I can teach you the basics, but you're bringing some of the intangibles and some experience that will make us better. And so that was a real eye opener for me. And then was really sort of the driver to say, look, like this role is again out of my wheelhouse. I can learn from Jenny and I can get uncomfortable again and, you know, try something different and see if this is maybe a route that I really want to go. But as I was looking sort of at my experiences from the league to the team, media seemed like another good piece of the puzzle if I really wanted to fully understand the sports industry. But coming into it, I was a bit of a lost puppy at first. It was, I was now at a director level. I'd gone from senior manager to a director. I had seven networks essentially looking to me and people that have been in their roles for 20 plus years, looking to me for strategic advice, for, you know, direction and really, how are we going to do things differently? And I was very uncomfortable. And then I had to, like, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, we were tapping into segmentation studies. We were looking at how are we aggregating data and tracking marketing. And this was all things that I had never done, but it was a little bit of fake it till you make it and embrace, you know, being in a role that was going to challenge me. And, and I kind of had to step up to the plate. So there's a lot of extra hours. There was, you know, a lot of just very honest moments with, you know, some of my counterparts and Earl Canburn was my right-hand guy. And just saying like, I don't know what this is, what this means, what, what is a lower third or what is an enhancement in a broadcast. And so just being honest that there was things I didn't know and that was okay. Mm. It just wrinkled on for a bit there. So <laughs> No, so it was unpacked there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, at the end of the day, I, just the theme, the constant theme that went through that was the you were just transparent about mm -hmm. what you didn't know. And like, it, it sounds like to me, you were OK with just telling people, hey, probably trusted people, trusted right? People. Trusted colleagues that like, I don't I don't know what a lower third means. And yeah, I can Google it, but I want to make sure I know what you guys want. Like, right. Every company is different in the way they, you know, have their jargon and all that stuff. Like, what does that mean with you guys? Like, what am I supposed to do? Or you just told me to do this in two seconds and I don't even know what a lower third is. So how am I supposed to get this done? Like, and that's hard to do. A lot of people feel like they need to know all the answers in order to be successful and like you always have to be perfect and you always have to be on and you were successful at NBC sports but because you were honest about your capabilities is that is that fair yeah I mean there was certainly moments in the beginning where I I pushed myself to say I've got to learn everything I, I put in the extra hours to try to like at least build my baseline knowledge but it just got to a point where it's like I need to work smarter not harder and just be honest because I'm, I'm not going to be able to do my job if I'm not asking questions or not being transparent that I don't know something. It's just much more efficient for me to go over and say, hey, Earl, what, what does this mean? Or can you help me understand that? Or leveraging the you know one-on-ones I have with Jenny to just kind of roll through and say, here's, you know, here's where I'd love your perspective, or here's what I'm not fully sure about. And, you know, just kind of took those opportunities to raise my hand and say, look, I, I can be so much better if I just ask this question or if I'm, you know, okay with, you know, saying that I don't really know something, but finding again, you, that was a great point. The, the trusted advisors are the people that you can really kind of lean on internally to ask what, you know, might be a silly question in your eyes, but could really help you do your job better and differently. Yeah. Jenny was awesome as a manager in that. And she knew I was out of my comfort zone. And, and she certainly had a good way of being there when I needed it, needed her or needed to ask her questions, but also like having a bit of a distance to let me figure it out on my own. And I think that I'm really grateful for as well, as painful as it was at times. And I didn't feel like I know it was, I knew what I was doing. She let mm -hmm. me fail. She let me figure it out. And that I think made me better as well. 
Yeah, that's a sign of a good leader, good manager, and just letting you fail, but not holding it against you. Not, you know what I mean? Using it as a growth moment and nurturing you along the way, like almost like as a coach would versus just pointing their finger, like you did this wrong, get it together, you know, and, and working under that sort of high stress, not that you weren't under high stress, but you know, those managers that, right. Like, you know, those managers who are just like, it's just, they demand so much, but they don't coach nurture or help you get to that level. It's almost like you're expected to get there on your own. Yep. Yeah. She was a great, great leader in that sense of pushing me, but also giving me the room to, to learn and, and grow kind of on my own in a way, which was, which was great. When did you make the jump to soccer? Ooh, uh, six months ago. So after NBC sports, I went back to the NBA, got a call from Amy Brooks, who was leading the group at the time. And this is a good lesson in just keeping relationships and keeping in touch and staying top of mind. And so there was an opportunity that presented itself and she gave me a call and asked if I wanted to come back. And it was kind of hard to say, say no to that, to, to lead the partnerships vertical within Teambo and again, continue to apply all the things that I had learned. But the soccer role came about from a text. I remember late one night from Dr. Sutton and he said, Hey, you need to talk to Dave, Wright." There's, he's building something special there. You've got to talk to him. And so they were out to dinner, I guess. And Dave was telling him everything that's happening here at U.S. Soccer and the opportunity as we're bringing our commercial rights in-house. And so thanks to, to Doc, I am here at U.S. Soccer. I had the conversation with Dave and he was somebody that I'd had my eye on for a long time as a, a leader and somebody that I had met early on, but, you know, I'd heard through my friends and, you know, colleagues in the industry that he was an equally amazing leader and, and visionary. And uh, so was something that again I, I couldn't help but want to at least take the call and understand what was what was happening here. And a few weeks later, I'm officially at a uh, US soccer now overseeing our, our partnership marketing team. Wow. And it's only been six months. That's... Only been six months. Yeah. It's crazy how fast it's gone. But it's been a, a, a journey in talking about getting uncomfortable like soccer. I didn't grow up playing soccer. Soccer wasn't a number one sport in in my household. And so that's a uh, it's been an interesting learning curve, but it was one where it, when I was talking to Dave and understanding what we're building, not only from just what's happening at the Federation from a commercial rights and you know just organizational evolution standpoint, but as you look at soccer and where soccer is headed from a growth standpoint with the 2026 World Cup here, Olympics, and our women's team just being just again, total badasses and number one in the world. Like it just was hard not to see that there's a lot of opportunity here to come in and, and make an impact, but be somewhere that's, you know, kind of on the rise. Talk about what that was like. So now you're an executive, you're coming in and what was that process like asking for what you want? Did you negotiate without, you know, you could tell us as much as you want, like, or not, mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, what was that process like? Cause it's, it's nerve wracking. And a lot of when we're like, uh, I'm grateful for this job. They, this is what they see in me. And this is how much I'm worth. Okay. I'll take it. But some women are like, no, you owe me like my sister. Nope. You're going to pay me more. You're going to pay me exactly what I'm worth. And I know what it is. Right. And so, I mean, she's in a different field. She's a lawyer. So it's a little different, but it's a little different. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get, you get it. There's a, it's a lot more easier to compare salaries, right. In, in that industry, but just take us through that process of making that jump to becoming an executive. It's a scary process. I think that's the best way to describe it. Because again, I wasn't looking to leave the NBA. It was an opportunity that sort of presented itself on its own. And if I look back at it, I remember some of the scariest parts of the process was really telling Amy that this opportunity was was here and having those very honest conversations with her to to explain why I was intrigued by this opportunity, why I saw it as a a growth opportunity for me and and why I would leave. But at the same time, from a negotiation standpoint, I was talking to Dave about really where I wanted to be. Where was I at now at the MBA from a salary perspective? I was trying to be realistic. We're, We're a nonprofit, right? So not to be greedy, but also recognize my value and that I wanted to continue to grow um, from a salary standpoint. So that was really my narrative of, look, I, I want to be fair. I'd had an idea of you know what somebody in this role would make just given my 
exposure to that at the NBA, mm-hmm. but also saying, look, like this is less about making a ton of money and it's more about the experience and the growth opportunity for, for me and just sort of the full package there. But also knowing that in those conversations with Amy, that she certainly came back and said, well, what is it going to take to keep you? And being confident in you know that potentially being more than what I would make at U.S. Soccer, but knowing that the rest of the package at U.S. Soccer was really what I was hoping for for, for myself from a growth standpoint. So some difficult conversations and one that I would go into on both sides with Amy and Dave and have my talking points in front of me. And, you know, it was a nervous wreck. I remember saying to Brian that like, I was like sweating. I'm like, I've got to call Amy now and I've got to break the news, but I had my talking points and the confidence comes in as you, you start to talk about it and then, then recognize it. Like, look, I'm making this decision for me. And I know that I've got all these pieces that, you know, make sense. Um, not just from a sal- again, not just from a salary standpoint, but from a growth and you know just an overarching opportunity to come in and build it. It was a great conversation with her. She totally understood, and you know, I think that says a lot about her. And and it wasn't as scary on the back end of it, but going into it, there was a lot of nerve wracking moments. And I think it it doesn't necessarily get easier, but I think as you build up your resume and build up your capabilities and and what you recognize as, as your value makes those conversations just a, just a tad bit easier, I guess. I don't know if that made any sense, but. <laughs> yes, it totally. No, it made no sense. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes. It totally made <laughs> yeah. sense. And I love that you had your talking points, like both, like both sides, like writing down what you want to talk about and making sure like you got your points across. Like, it is okay to go into a negotiation with talking points, even, you know what I mean? Like, even if they're in your head, but if you have to write them down and put them in your notebook and take your notebook with you, I think, I think that's really, that's really smart. There's a lot. It's emotional. I like like blacked out because I was so nervous. Like, (laughs) But if I have it in front of me and it it helps the conversation, but I was a nervous wreck (laughs) and that was super helpful. So highly, highly recommend it. Yes, it is okay. We talked about this at the summit. It is okay to be nervous. It is so normal. Like it is, you're excited and it's emotional and there's nothing like, yeah, like there's just nothing. It's not something you do every day. We are not lawyers. We are not negotiating every single day. Like it is not easy for a lot of us. It doesn't come natural. And so being prepared and just being okay with, I'm nervous and maybe I'm going to wear black that day because I'm going to sweat a lot. Like it's yeah. okay. You know what I mean? Or I'm going to go sleeveless like because I'm going to sweat. Like, yep. It's all right. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But just like recognizing all that stuff and just making sure like, okay, like I'm going to be, I might be a little awkward. That's okay. Like I'm not going to be perfect in this conversation because there's no such thing. And just going in and having your talking points and really just, I know it's hard. It's easier said than done, but also having fun, like not rushing through to get to the end of it, embracing that awkwardness, that uncomfortableness, because that's where you grow. Yeah. And embracing the awkwardness is probably the story of my life, but (laughs) same, same. (laughs) I didn't always do that. Like, so, I mean, it's easier to say it now, right? Right. Like 10 years ago, I'd be like, no, I can't. I'm so awkward. I'm so embarrassed. I need to be perfect next time. And now I'm like, oh, Mm -hmm. it's just me. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like, this is who I am. And I just need to be authentic to myself. Sometimes I'm awkward. Sometimes I don't want to talk to people. Sometimes Mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like I am very quiet and shy and other times you can't shut me up. I don't. Sometimes I'm goofy and silly and yeah, but I think that really makes you, you and endearing. And I think that's actually helped me quite a bit in my journey is just Finding those moments to be authentic, whether it's with my team as a leader or with the teams that I'm working with to build up those relationships with our partners. And so you start to recognize over time that people are human and Mm -hmm. you yourself are human and it's okay. Like you don't have to be perfect again, like speaking to myself here, but I think just over time, you, you, you find that people appreciate that. And whether that's in uncomfortable conversations or just in your normal day to day, that just, you know, not everybody's a robot and that's fine. Yeah. La- okay. Last question before rapid fire questions. So oh. yeah. <laughs> you didn't know about those, did you? No. Um, so last question though, I know authenticity is your superpower. Like how did you, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, 
how did you show up and be your authentic self throughout your career? Like, I know that's a, like a loaded question, but like, is. is there just one common theme or thread like throughout your career, like you, that allowed you to show up as your authentic self? I think that I thread humor in a lot of my day to day. And I think that kind of helps to one, get over some of my awkwardness and uncomfortableness, but also like shows people that you know, I'm not a robot. And I think that has helped demonstrate sort of my authenticity and not being afraid to show, be vulnerable in moments, right? Like whether that's the negotiation or in a getting ready for a presentation that I'm nervous about and, and expressing that, you know, nervousness to my peers and just being honest in those moments. <laughs> this is a funny example, but recent. I being new at US soccer and being remote, it's been a little bit challenging to build relationships and really kind of work cross functionally. And so I had the opportunity following the She Believe Summit. There was a window from when the summit ended to when I was heading out on a red eye and ended up hopping in a van with a number of the girls that work on our events team to go to the Angel City FC game. And I found myself on the ride back rapping to some 20, 2010, some classics and, you know, got a lot of cred from the girls in the group that I was there rapping right alongside them. And <laughs> there was moments where I said, is this appropriate as a vice president? But then other moments where I was like, you know what, this is me and I appreciate a good beat. And I'm hopefully, you know, building some, some trust with them that I am, I am not a, a stiff by any means. What song was it? Probably not appropriate to share. <laughs> uh, I knew it. I was like, I want to know what song it is. Yeah. yeah. No, I look back and like, hmm, maybe not the right choice, but you know, we bonded. So exactly. And it was fun. Yeah. It was, it fun, was fun. fun to have fun, to laugh, just to be yourself. Yes. Okay. All right. Rapid fire. Are you ready? So ready. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys can't see her face. I don't, I don't know if she's ready. I think she's like, I have to, so let's just do it. All okay. right. 12 questions. It goes by really fast. First thing that comes to your mind. First one, what is your favorite sports moment? 2015 world series run with the Mets for me. Uh, mm-hmm. All right. Gosh, 2015 seems like so long ago, but it does. I feel old. Yes. Really yeah, I mean, hey, yeah. listen, if you feel old, then I really feel old. Mm-hmm. All right. What is something people always get wrong about you? I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I tend to have a resting bitch face. And so people think that I could be mean, but I'm actually, I'd like to think that I'm not mean, but I just can't help my facial expressions sometimes. <laughs> oh my God. We are, we are the same. People are like, oh my God, you look so mad. I was like, I'm yeah. literally just sitting here. Like, just sitting here <laughs> thinking. So my thinking face looks angry. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what to tell you. What is one food you wouldn't want to give up? Chocolate. Anything chocolate. Donuts, cake, cookies. <laughs> I'm a cookie monster. My, you can't see my phone screen, but I have a quote from Cookie Monster on there. Stop it. <laughs> I do. Yeah, it says... This is one of my favorites. It says, today me will live in the moment unless it's unpleasant, in which case me will eat a cookie. <laughs> oh, that's how I feel about pizza. All yeah. right. Are you a morning person or a night person? Morning. Favorite holiday? St. Patrick's Day. Oh. What job would you be absolutely horrible at doing? A sideline broadcaster, like <laughs> thinking on my feet and having a microphone in front of me, not really for me. <laughs> Good to know. What product would you seriously stockpile if you found out they weren't going to sell it anymore? I've been really into perfect bars lately. The perfect the protein bars. bars. Perfect bar. Oh. Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm addicted to those right now. All right. We have lots of things to link in the show notes. Car Adams, <laughs> Dr. Sutton, UCF, Masters, mm-hmm. Teambo, and perfect bars. <laughs> All those will be in the show notes for you. Being my authentic self. <laughs> uh let's see what's your favorite app zillow i spend a lot of time on zillow is it because i'm really bad at rapid fire i don't know why i do them is it because you are looking for a place or because you just like to dream about what place you want like in the future it's a little bit of both i renovated a cabin in a pandemic this is another long story but if i wasn't working in sports i would be either a real estate or like an interior design. So I love to just think about projects and where I'd want to live. 
yeah. So Zillow is sort of my way to decompress and just scrolling through and looking to see what's around or just dreaming big. What? You renovated a cabin? I did. What? Yeah. Is it like your cabin or did you like flip it? I ended up flipping it. The plan was to renovate it and put it on Airbnb, but the market was so hot within yeah. like 10 months, I sold it for 2X what I put into it. Yes, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was so fun. It was such a great learning experience. There isn't, you know, it was the pandemic needed some distractions from the day-to-day work craziness of dealing with the MBA bubble. So that was really my way to like, at the end of the day, paint something or build some shelves. It was rather therapeutic. And then also felt really good when I made some money on it. That's awesome. I love that story. And not to play the comparison game, but I'm going to, I ate a lot of food and started a podcast. I like your story That's so awesome. much better. <laughs> I want to switch. Strong, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh my God. That's awesome. Congrats. Thanks, uh, okay. so fun. I'll show you pictures one day. Oh yes, I definitely, uh, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, Instagram all day. Yeah. Ooh, I, yeah I have to put limits on mine. It's really bad. Mm-hmm. No, I don't, I don't love it. I, I deleted the app and then now I just like from my home screen and now I just search for it and I'm on it. Like it's a problem. Twitter is probably second to that just from a news perspective and sports industry stuff, but Instagram, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. it's a time for me. It really, it really is. Uh, who's your biggest inspiration in life? My mom. She's pretty special. She's a tough cookie. As a child, what did you wish to become when you grew up? Oh, a veterinarian. I loved animals. I loved dogs. I used to study the <laughs> dog section of the encyclopedia. Again, a little nerdy, but realized pretty quickly that I wasn't going to emotionally be able to handle if a dog died or if I had to oh, no. do surgery on a dog. So now I just love on my dog and yeah. What kind of dog do you have? He's a mutt. He was a stray that we found in the neighborhood of the cabin that I renovated. Oh, he literally just <laughs> found his way to our front door. Yeah. Yeah. I love your pandemic story. <laughs> it's such a good one. It's All right. A random one. That's for sure. <laughs> Last question. Finish this sentence. The future of women working in sports is so bright. Yes. hundred percent agree. Coming off of the She Believes Summit, it was even more apparent. There were some incredible young women in the audience asking so many good questions and so engaged. But then you look at the ladies and gentlemen that were on stage and you're just reassured that there's, there's only so much more ahead. Yeah. This next generation. Woo, watch mm-hmm. out. I am so yeah. excited. Kelly, this has been amazing. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, how can they do that? They can reach out to me on LinkedIn. All right. It's pretty easy to find me. There are a lot of Kelly Higginses, but I'll be the ginger that's a US <laughs> hacker. So, <laughs> and I will link to it in the show notes Great. so you can find the right Kelly Higgins. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. So, what did you think of this episode? Do you know another woman who works or is aspiring to work in sports? Would you do me a favor and share this with them? It would mean so much if together we could support and inspire other women on their journey. And let's stay connected. I love meeting and talking to new people. Follow me on Instagram at Jahan Blake and join the free game of her own community by visiting jahanblake.com. I can't wait to meet you.